Okay, we're back. This is Dave Vellante. I'm here with Jeff Kelly. We're, we're with Wikibon.org. This is theCUBE, SiliconANGLE's production of the MongoDB Days event here um, in New York City. We're live at the Marriott Marquis. Charity Majors is here. She is an engineer at Parse, a company that just recently got acquired by Facebook. Charity, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. So we're talking about off camera about Parse and you were expressing um, the you were effusive, actually, in, in your remarks about the engineers at, at Parse. Um, tell us about Parse. Uh, Parse is a uh, mobile backend. It's mobile backend is a service, basically. Uh, if you're a developer and you want to write an iOS app or an Android app, we provide APIs, SDKs. We handle all of the backend work, all of the scaling, all of the push notifications. It's pretty magical, you know, you can just, you can issue just a couple API requests to set up users, change their passwords, uh, it works really great. And like I was telling you, the team that I work with is amazing. There's so what makes them amazing? Well, as a developer, what do you look for in a, in a, in a team that excites you? Um, in the team, I look for versatility. I look for people who are really excited about tackling problems throughout the stack. Because when you're, when you're that small, and we were like you know, 11 or 12 people when I joined, uh, everyone pretty much has to work on everything. There's no like, well, okay, I'm going to work on the database and you're going to work on, you know, push notifications. Everybody's hands are kind of in the entire, in the entire <coughs> pot of soup. So, you know, just really strong generalists with a really solid background in algorithms and scalability. Yeah, so you're obviously mobile is your reason for being. Um, Talk a little bit about that. You know, you're acquired by Facebook. You know, trying to get its mobile mojo going. So, um, so, so, why did the company form? Um, talk a little bit about the the mobile action that you guys bring to Facebook. Right. Well, the company formed when our founders, who were in YC, <clears throat> were getting irritated because they kept trying to build mobile apps and they had to keep building the same boilerplate over and over and over. And finally, Ilya was like, this is enough. <laughs> We're going to start a company. There's clearly a business <laughs> opportunity in building these things so the developers don't just have to keep rebuilding them. So we've done that, and I think we've done you know, that part of our mission pretty successfully. Um, and I think that when Facebook looked at us, they, see, they, they just see a team who does developer platforms and developer tools really, really well. I mean, the developers who use Parse, um, by and large, they love it. Like, I get people attacking me in the elevator. They see my sweatshirt that says Parse, and they're like, oh my God, you work at Parse? It's the coolest thing. And they'll have their story about how their roommate like built an app in an hour. And you know, they went to this hackathon, and they like built the whole thing using Parse as a back end. And like, that kind of excitement, it's really neat to get to work on a product that people are, will just like attack you about, because they love it. So, talk about why it it's so easy to use Parse, and some of your experiences as a developer. Um, right. Kind of the before and after so of Parse. For, I'm not really a developer. I am not the kind of developer who writes apps anyway. So mm -hmm. this is all from observation. I'm the other kind of like developer. I'm the one who builds the things in the back end, and I like can't write a web page or anything that looks pretty to save my life. But the people who are really good at like making a really good user experience and, and you know flow and something that's really attractive to people, they tend to also get really frustrated with having to, you know, create a schema and index their databases and, you know, figure out how to shard and how to scale and, oh, if you want to do Android, you have to spin up hundreds of nodes to hold open sockets to every single Android device that you want to push to all the time. These are just, these are fun problems to me. These are not fun problems yeah. to the <laughs> people we're pitching to. <laughs> the people yeah. that we're pitching to who want to spend all their time making things beautiful and elegant and usable, they love Parse because they get to spend all their time doing what they love. Mm. So you're building back-end architecture, yes. you're making it, a, you know, productizing it or yes. servicizing it. Productizing it and making it able to scale. Yeah. Some of the, some of the, our clients, they'll build, they'll build, they'll build an app, you know, all apps start out slow with no audience. Some of our clients have gone from, you know, no traffic to like being featured in the app store overnight. Now, as you can imagine, that is extremely hard to anticipate and it's extremely hard to build for even if you can anticipate it. And the fact is that the Parse platform, it's there and it's all ready to scale to build that. So if you get lucky and your amazing little app just <coughs> takes off, well, your users are going to be happy because it's not suddenly crashing and falling over due to capacity problems due to the rapid rate of growth. So Facebook sees this, they say, okay, we got, we got to get, you know, 
going in mobile, this is a great way to you know, expand our ecosystem of developers, boom, yeah. up in Parse. I mean, right now, Parse is a self-contained unit. Uh, they're not asking us to make any changes to what we're doing or our roadmap or any of that stuff, which mm -hmm. is really nice and really reassuring to all of us. Right. Um, I think that they're hoping that you know their developer teams and their developer platforms can work alongside our you know developer team, developer platforms, and we can kind of learn from each other. Fantastic. So, so you mentioned you know the, the, the parse backend's got to be flexible, it's got to be able to scale kind of at a drop of a hat. So I'm guessing based on that and based on the conference we're at today, you don't have an Oracle backend. You are probably working with a, 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 <laughs> different, funny, a different yeah. database. <laughs> funny uh, you should mention Yeah, so why don't we tell a little bit about the database. Um, yeah. We're working with Mongo and tell us a little bit about that and how that helps you do yeah. just those things, scale and be flexible. So first of all, obviously we can't really work with a traditional relational d database. Um, one obvious reason, we host over 100,000 apps. This means we have over 100,000 schemas and we have to index for all of those schemas. And every day, you know, another 10,000 or so apps is going to sign up and they have their own schemas. Yeah, you, you just can't do that with a normal database. We've been able to do all of this with Mongo. We, we use Mongo uh, extensively in several different ways. Um, all, all of those 100,000 apps, um, their data is stored in our Mongo clusters. Um, we also use Mongo for some backend analytics, um, aggregation, billing, that sort of thing. And for a semi-real-time anti-DDoS uh, cluster that helps us like analyze traffic in near real time and make some decisions about what to do with it. Um, yeah, I mean, Mong Mongo's been, Mongo, Mongo is probably the only database out there that can really let us do what we've done in the time frame that we've done mm -hmm. it. Yeah, let's dig into that a little bit. What are you know maybe one or two of the key characteristics of Mongo that that really make it perfect for your environment. Right, so it's a document database, so mm -hmm. people can put whatever they want into it. Mm -hmm. There's really just no constraints. Um, it scales horizontally really, really well. We weren't able to use the built-in Mongo sharding, but we were pretty easily able to wrap our own like application level sharding on top mm -hmm. of it. Um, the replica sets, absolutely key. I mean, we run on AWS, right? And it, if an availability zone goes down, um, Mongo just fails over seamlessly to another replica set member and another AZ, and like, we may not even notice. Like it never happened. Like it never happened. Very good. We, um, we had some folks on at the Cube, uh, uh, not the first one, but I was, at, uh, I was telling you offline, we, we were at uh, Velocity this week and somebody came on with Google Glass. It wasn't the first person, but, but so, what do you think of the whole wearable trend? Um, Where's that going to go? Is that sort of the next wave beyond mobile? Does it integrate with mobile? You know? Dude, I don't know. I'm really kind of a Luddite. I still run operating systems from the 1970s. <laughs> 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 I'm a, I'm okay, a Linux so, hard. <laughs> so you're not, you're not buying into this I, whole wearable computer I, I usually buy into these fads uh, lo long after they're no longer cool. So. Okay, so. <laughs> like I, ba I barely use mobile apps myself. <laughs> uh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's kind of funny because like uh, the kind of people that we are building for are often not the kind of engineers that we need on the back end building these things for those people. So it's so who are those people that you're that you're building for? Talk about them a little bit. Um, what role do they have in the organization? Are they people who are driving strategy? Is it uh, technical? You're people? talking about our, our customers. Yeah, yeah, your customers. Oh wow, uh, it's kind of hard to generalize uh, because there are so many. But a lot of them, we have a lot of just independent developers. You know, a guy who builds a game, a guy who has an idea that he wants to noodle around with on the weekend. It's really great for them because our base tier is free. Like you can get started, you can get a no credit card. You can get a million yeah. API requests per month before you, we even start charging you anything. So that's a really, it's really inviting for people to just kind of log in and play around and get a feel for it. So there are those. There are a lot of um, independent game developers, mm -hmm. independent app app developers. Some people use Parse for only part of our infrastructure because they've already built their own. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of people who will just use us for push notifications because maybe they have other needs that their backend, um, they need a very specific type of backend mm -hmm. for. Um, we also have older and more established apps that will pick us up for things like user management or push notifications, that sort of thing. Um, we have a lot of customers who are for like advertising agencies or promotional agencies, mm -hmm. you know, the kinds of apps that they aren't necessarily long-lived, but they're fun, you know, they're for an event. 
you know, like for the Super Bowl or for some sort of promotional thing or like, you know, Home Depot is running some. So they want to make they want to make a fun little app and it, it'll it'll live for a few months and then you just throw it away. Disposable I mean, apps. Right. I mean, Parse is amazing for that because you don't have to build a whole back end right. every time. You don't have to buy, buy all the gear and build up your own infrastructure and then, well, we're not using the app anymore two months later. And pay all those engineers. Right. I mean, it's so expensive to hire good engineering talent to work on these things. <laughs> Absolutely. And I can see uh, any number of ways Facebook could, could leverage this technology, clearly. Charity, you're speaking uh, at this event uh, today. Yes. A few minutes. Um, What's the talk on? You know, give us a little, little preview. Little preview. I'm talking about managing a maturing MongoDB ecosystem. Um, I myself actually have only been using Mongo for a year. <laughs> Newbie. It feels so much longer. <laughs> uh, I have learned so much. Um, and after starting to, so I set off the you know description of this talk uh, to Tengen, and then I later realized that I really have like three talks worth of material. So I've been kind of trying to <laughs> compress it. Um, it's basically, the first third of it is going to be treating your Mongo infrastructure as code. So, you know, chefing everything and making everything um, automated. I'm also going to talk about some of the most important performance tuning lessons that we've learned. Um, things like, you know, what kind of hardware to provision, how to tune your block devices, and your file systems, and so forth. And, my favorite. I'm going to talk about some really fun failure scenarios that we have encountered and how to recover from them, how, how to try and prevent them, and once you're in them, how to dig yourself back out of them without you know, completely screwing your data or leading to way more downtime than necessary. The, these big traumatic events, they happen to us all eventually, and I'm just hoping to kind of share some of what I've learned so that not everyone has, has to figure it out. Yeah, I heard a great talk at Velocity this week. I think Johan Bergstrom, I believe, was the gentleman who gave the talk on risk. You know, talking about um, software as essentially a machine mm -hmm. with a lot of different components and how you try to make those components resilient. Yeah. Uh, and by doing so, you add complexity into the system. Absolutely. And, and I know from my many years in this business that error recovery <laughs> is really challenging. It is. So, and then you inject mobile into the equation um, and it gets even more complicated. Yeah. I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit, what you're seeing is, is best practice and how you're solving some of these problems. Uh, you know, a lot of it uh, is the interaction between Mongo and AWS. Uh, you know, there's always the risk. It's funny because we're a platform running on top of another platform, you know? So you have to build your own platform to be fault tolerant, and at the same time, you have to build it to be resilient to the platform below it going down. Now Amazon doesn't go down that often. But when it does, everybody knows but about <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah, it's on the front page. When it does, everyone knows about it. So there are ways to build your underlying architecture such that you know you can you can never handle it if the entire thing just completely goes away. Fortunately that almost never happens. What usually happens is an availability zone goes away, the ELBs have trouble, there are EBS problems and so forth. So we spend a lot of time thinking about uh, possible AWS failures and what we can do to either make us resilient to them, like in the case of you know Mongo filling over the primary, mm -hmm. or just figuring out, so like, let's say 20% of our hard disks just kind of disappear. What do we jump into action and do? You know, what are our best practices to like mitigate the risk, um, keep it as, as, as localized as possible? So there's that. There's also, you know, we're always trying to think about how can we, when, so, when something goes wrong on our end, how can we make it affect as few as possible of our users? You know, I mean, there's no way around it. Sometimes it's going to suck for some people. But it, we're trying really hard as Parse is growing up to isolate those consequences to only that set of users so that everyone else remains unaffected. That's, that's a big part of what we're working on right now. And then part of your talk is uh, performance tuning. I'm kind of interested in, in that aspect as, as well. Again, mobile. You know, everything's going great that we hear from Google, the web's getting faster, yeah. that's, all, that's all wonderful. And then all of a sudden mobile comes in and everything slows down. Yeah. So, talk about the performance tuning aspects. How do you even find problems? I mean, you have so much more of a complex infrastructure now. Yeah. Um, and, and how do you find them? How do you deal with them? Well, we have a lot of graphs. <laughs> yeah, so you got to visualize have, them. That's we have important. a lot of graphs. We yeah. visualize as many metrics as we can find, and we're finding new ones every week. We're like, oh yeah, you know, if we had seen this 
on the monitor on the wall, we would have known that something was about to happen there. So, you know, there's a lot of visualization, as you say. There's a lot of figuring out exactly where the thresholds are. So, you know, there, there's always going to be some, you know, some churn. Um, and we don't want to be paging ourselves every 30 minutes, you know? So it's always kind of an art form to figure out at what point is it going to begin to impact the user's experience? And how can we page ourselves right before that? You know? <laughs> so you're taking in a lot of machine data to do this? Uh, you guys a Splunk customer? Or? We, nope, we usually, we mostly use Ganglia uh -huh. right now for all of our graphs. Ganglia and Nagios for most of our graphing and alerting. Uh, we also use some of the uh, AWS uh, CloudWatch graphs. Okay. And uh, we have, we call it our NOC, <laughs> mounted on the yeah, wall yeah, that yeah. merges a bunch in of metrics from, <laughs> from yeah, all yeah. of our different sources. Yeah, so performance tuning, uh, the stuff that I'm talking about today is very Mongo specific. You know, how do you tune your MongoDB disks and volumes and RAID arrays and you know, your, your, your memory and how do you warm them up when you have an old secondary that you need to rotate in to be the primary because if you don't warm it up, then performance is going to suck. And you know, how do you tend to your data because all databases decay over time. Mm. You know, the data fragments, uh, it gets spread out over disk um, so it becomes a lot slower to find what you're looking for. So you have to introduce some instability into that system to repair that and then you know, rotate in the repaired node. And, and we're, we're at the point of trying to automate all of these processes as well. It's, it's, it's a tricky thing to automate, but at the scale that we are hoping right. to be, you really have to do it. So the automation comes for, so today you're just doing a lot of scripting, um, or are you yeah. able to eliminate that? Everything, or? everything from a like setup perspective is Chef. Like we use Chef ex Extensively, and if we are, you know, tearing down an old node, bringing up a new one from snapshot, single command, it's all shift. Um, we we have a lot of scripts for things like running compaction on all of our nodes, and you know, warming up secondaries from the uh, hottest data on the primary. Um, but the uh, the glue between some of these things is not yet really implemented. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what we'll be doing in the next. How few about months. how about uh, flash uh, flash storage? Is that playing at all? Uh, no, we don't. It's not available in AWS, and honestly, disk speed is not a bottleneck for us. We do use provisioned IOPS. Uh, we can use provisioned IOPS or SSDs, which are just regular database quality hardware, very fast random seeks. So, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, okay, so, so, so from a performance standpoint, it's just a lot of hard work just <laughs> getting it right. There's a lot going on under the hood, which makes it very easy for our developers to just, you know, issue a few API requests and make an app go. <laughs> <laughs> so my last question, uh, I don't know if Jeff has anything else, but um, talk to the young developers in, in the crowd. Young engineers, young developers, you know, like you, they maybe, maybe grow up in the, in the middle of the country somewhere, they might want to go to Silicon Valley yeah. or you know, San Francisco. What's your advice? What I would say is, if you are a young developer who loves making games, you know, mobile games and social media, and or a designer who really likes to make things pretty and elegant and beautiful, you know, start with the Parse APIs because it'll let you hone your craft while not getting bogged down shaving the yak, as we say. <laughs> 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 On the other hand, <coughs> if you're a young engineer in the middle of the country and you like hacking on databases, and you know, tuning queries and messing with kernel level, you know, performance tuning. Then you should apply to work with us. <laughs> you guys hiring? Absolutely. What kind of folks are you hiring? Smart you people. There you go. <laughs> Smart people who. Smart people who like to write code. So just the flip side of that of, of Dave's question is: so what would you say to enterprise developers who haven't really gotten into mobile yet? Mm. Don't have that kind of haven't haven't developed a mobile you know, platform. Those are some of our best customers, you know, because they know how hard this is. Mm -hmm. And they're grateful that they don't have to do it, or they don't have to do all of it. Mm. You know, and if they're enterprise, like we we are, we have custom things that we can set up for them to like give them extra reassurance mm -hmm. that you know, because right. they have SLAs and we right. understand that. Exactly. All right, Charity, we're getting the we're getting the hook here. Out of time, so thanks very much for coming on. Thanks you're an awesome me. person. I love your enthusiasm and. Uh, Congratulations on the acquisition. Good luck with the big company thing. Thanks. And uh, we'll, we'll love to have you on again. Fantastic. All right, keep it right there, everybody. Jeff Kelly and I will be back. This is theCUBE. We're right back from New York City at the MongoDB event.